If you take your Bible this morning and turn with me to the book of 1 Kings. 1 Kings this morning. We have been, as a church, doing a series over the summer months in the life of Elijah. And as Dan mentioned, we are reading through uh, the Bible, a two-year Bible reading program. And so over the summer, we've been reading through uh, mainly the books of First and Second Kings. We just finished First Kings this week, and tomorrow we launch into Second Kings. And so I've been preaching a series on the life of Elijah. He's kind of right in the middle of that series, right in the middle of that reading. And this morning we come to the passage of Scripture that we have been waiting for. Elijah comes on the scene in the first part of 1 Kings chapter 17. He comes on out of the scene really out of nowhere. We don't know who this guy is. We don't really know. We we know the town, but, you know, we don't know really where that town is, right? It's like saying, well, he's from Riversdale. Everybody's like, well, where's that from, right? We have no idea where that is, right? So we don't know where Tishbe is. This guy comes from nowhere, and he comes into the court of King Ahab, and he says to Ahab, it shall not rain except by my word. Elijah has a passion for the glory of God. Elijah has a passion for the word of God to go out to his people. And as Elijah looks across the landscape of the nation of Israel, the the people are far, far from God. The people have forsaken the God who redeemed them, and they have given themselves to worship after the false god of Baal. Led by the king Ahab and his queen Jezebel, who have brought in the prophets of Baal from Sidon, And the people have turned their backs from God. Our God is a jealous God. Our God is a merciful God. He will not abandon his people. And so he sends his prophet to call his people back to him. But so often as God does, God brings a trial into the life of his people with the intent of softening their hearts so that when the message comes, they will be open to receiving that message. And so, as we've seen all the way through uh, 1 Kings chapter 17, a drought has ravaged the land. For three and a half years, there has been no rain. But 1 Kings 18 verse 1 opened with the words, opened with these words that God speaks to Elijah. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year saying, Go show yourself to Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. So rain is coming, but God is concerned about this. If God just turns on the fountains, if God just sends the rain again, that the people will credit that rain to Baal. They'll say, oh, Baal has finally woke up. Baal has resurrected. Baal has sent rain again. So God is going to send rain, but he is going to make sure that he reveals himself in an unmistakable way so that the people will know exactly who sent the rain. And that's where we come to in the middle of 1 Kings 18, and we're going to pick up the account in verse 20. So I trust you have your Bible with you. Open your Bible, 1 Kings 18, verse 20. If you don't have a Bible, if you're in a green chair, there will be a black Bible somewhere in front of you. If you're in a blue chair, I'm sorry. (laughs) But you need your Bible. We want to be in God's Word together. So 1 Kings chapter 18, follow with me, verse 20. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets, that is the prophets of Baal and the prophets of Asherah, Together at Mount Carmel, Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us. Let them choose one bull for themselves and, and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and lay it on wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of Jehovah. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. All the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first, for you are many. Call upon the name of your God and put no fire to it. They took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is musing or he is relieving himself or he's on a journey or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. 
And the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of Jehovah, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two says of seed. And he put the wood in order, and cut the bowl in places, and laid it on the wood. And he said, Fill four jars with water, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, Do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, Do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. At the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Jehovah, answer me, that this people may know that you, Jehovah, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of Jehovah fell, and consumed the burnt offering, and the wood, and the stones, and the dust, and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces, and said, Jehovah, he is God, Jehovah, he is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape, and they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. May God bless the reading of his word. Let's pray this morning. Father, we have read your word of a man who lived and walked this earth, Elijah. Lord, this is a, an account of history. This actually took place. And it has been written down for our instruction. It has been written down for our encouragement. It has been written down for our admonishment. God, that we would know you. The question that Elijah asked Israel is the question that lies before us, that we would follow you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And so, God, as we read your word this morning, may your word stir our hearts. May your word warm our affections. May your word draw us to yourself and your son. For it's in his precious name we pray. Amen. This is perhaps one of the greatest miracles, the greatest evidences of God's glory and power since the exodus from Egypt. So it's almost been a thousand years since God has shown himself in a way that we find ourselves in 1 Kings chapter 18. So a miracle of incredible proportions happens. God shows up in a way that is absolutely unmistakable. Now Elijah knows what's coming. Elijah, uh, Elijah knows what's going to happen. And so he begins by asking a question. And this is really the point of the entire passage. It all hinges on what he says in verse 21. Elijah says to the people, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow Him. If Baal, then follow Him. Now, reading through the Bible, this this passage should, should spark something in our memory because someone else had asked a very similar question. If you remember back, you back up a few books to the book of Joshua. Remember at the end of the book of Joshua, Joshua's getting ready, he knows the end of his life is near, and Joshua gathers the people together, and what does he say to them? He says the same thing. Choose who you're going to serve, whether the gods that your fathers served beyond the river, or the God who redeemed you out of Egypt. Choose who you're going to serve. And Joshua adds to that these words, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And so Elijah asks a very similar question. The issue here is made very clear. The people are wavering. The people are limping between Jehovah and Baal. Right? They're the people of God, and there's the outward religious sign of of worshiping Jehovah, but Baal worship is prevalent in their country. God is no fool. He is not mocked. And so he says to the people, choose. Who will you serve? Elijah challenges them who they will follow. Because God wants his people to follow him. God wants his people to follow him from their hearts. You see, the difference between Christianity and the religions of the world is that human man-made religion, outward conformity is enough. Right? What what did Baal want? Baal just wanted outward conformity. And you look across the religions even of our world, as long as you do your religious activity, that is sufficient. As long as you pray the prayers, as long as you give the money, as long as you do whatever it needs to do, then that's all that the gods care about. But the true God, he cares for so much more than that. 
The true God, he says, I want more than just your outward um, sign of religion. What does he want? He says, I want you to worship me with everything in you. In fact, he said this to the people of Israel in Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Uh, Moses had said to the people, Hear, O Israel, Jehovah our God, Jehovah is one. You shall love Jehovah with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might, with everything in you. God hates half-hearted worship. We're coming in our Bible reading to the prophets, and that's what the prophets condemn the people for, going through the motions of worship, but without a heart in it. In fact, we come to the book of Revelation. Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches. And of the church of Laodicea, he says this, I know your works. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. And the truth that we see here and the truth that we are confronted with in this passage is that the human heart is prone towards lukewarmness. The human heart is prone to wander. The human heart is prone towards projecting an image of spirituality without the true condition of the heart following along. The question that Elijah asks of the people is a question that we need to ask of ourselves every day. Will I serve God today? Will I follow God today? The challenge is, 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 is that we project something that's not there. And so what we can do is we can say, well, look, look at what I do. Look at my religious service. Look, you know, my Bible reading program, I got all my boxes checked off. Right? Hey, my attendance at church has been spot on. I have showed up. I serve at church. I do all of these things. Now, are all those things good things? <laughs> do I preach that you should do all of those things? Yes, I do. What's the problem? The problem is when we use those things to project a spirituality that's not there or we use them to barter with God, right? We say, hey, God, I read my Bible this week. I'd be really good if you could do this for me. Hey, Lord, you know, I was at church this past week. There's some things I would like to do if you could let me do that, right? What, that's man-made religion. <laughs> that's workspace religion. That's not Christianity. Christianity is about grace, It's not about works. And so we can project by what we do. And here's something else I think we can struggle with, especially in conservative evangelical churches. Um, We can project what we believe, but we don't live out what we believe, right? And so we rightly, I think, place an emphasis on good doctrine. What you believe is really important. (laughs) In fact, your eternity hinges on what you believe. What you believe is really important. But then we, we kind of back up and we make excuses for ourselves and we say, well, I, you know, I don't have to read my Bible every day. I don't have to go to church every Sunday. I don't have to, I don't have to I'm, it's not like I'm denying who Jesus is. It's not like, you know, I forget who God is. What's interesting is Elijah stands before Israel. Has Israel forgot who God is? Well, on one hand, no. They're not like Jehovah. Who, oh, Jehovah, Jehovah. Boy, I've heard that name. Like, who is that? The law. Man, I've heard the law. No, they haven't forgot, but they have forgot, haven't they? Because they're not living consistent with what they say they believe. And so we have a tendency in the church sometimes to do that, right? Because I got all my doctrine right. Yeah, I I can intellectually assent to all of those truths. But what's the problem? The problem is our heart. The problem is our heart. That our hearts grow cold towards God. Our hearts drift. So the question that Elijah confronts the people with, the question that we are confronted with is where do our passions lie? Where, where do we invest our time and energy and resources? And, and here's the, the truth. God's not looking for a verbal answer. God's watching our lives. Elijah's message to the people of Israel is clear. Fish or cut bait? Are you in or not? Quit playing games. And what's it say next? The end of verse 21. The people did not answer. This was not a time for silence. This was not a time to be quiet. And my assumption here, I'm reading between the lines. As preachers, we do that sometimes. But I think think there's a long pause here. Elijah shares the question, and he just lets it hang. And he looks around, and he looks around, and he looks around. The crickets are in the background. There is no answer Nobody will acknowledge. Nobody will say a thing. And what is Elijah doing here? Is Elijah surprised by their answer? <laughs> no. Elijah's aware of what's going on. Is God surprised by their answer? 
God's aware of what's going on. What is Elijah doing? He wants the people to be aware of their answer. Like, what does he want them to see? He wants to see, he wants them to see the condition of their own heart. And so he lets the question hang there. He's about to set up a contest between Jehovah and Baal, but it's not simply for the people's entertainment. They're not just there to watch. No, they are active participants in this. Elijah wants them to know they have a choice to make. God is going to call them to make that choice. Now, we established this important truth last week, that I am not God, and you're not God. Because if I was God, the text would end at the end of verse 21. It'd be done. Like, are you kidding me? What has God done for these people? I mean, who redeemed them from Egypt? Jehovah or Baal? Who parted the Red Sea? Jehovah or Baal? Who established his covenant with them on Mount Sinai? Jehovah or Baal? Who fed them with manna in the wilderness? Who brought quail for them? Who sustained them for 40 years? Who defeated their enemies before them? Who had parted the Jordan River? Who had brought them into the promised land? Who had given them all the blessings of the promised land? Who had established his glory among them at the temple in Jerusalem? Not Baal. Jehovah had done all of that. And what is the people's answer? Silence. <laughs> if I was God, <laughs> that is it. The fire's going to fall, all right. <laughs> it's going to fall on the people. So there's two really important lessons in this passage. The one is, is how our human hearts and how they tend to drift. The other important truth is this, the grace of God. Everything after verse 21 is the grace of God. The people f are fully under God's judgment. God does not have to show up again. He has shown up so many times. He doesn't need to show up one more time. Everything after verse 21 is the grace of God. And we see here that God's heart tends towards grace. Our God is the one pursu who pursues. Our God is the one who goes after us. We have no greater testimony than this in the cross of Jesus Christ. Paul writes in Romans, Our God demonstrates His love for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Our God came after us, not we after Him. It is not we who ascended to heaven, but our God who descended to earth. We must look for God's grace. We must go after God's grace. That's why week after week I say we need to be in God's word and we need to be in church and we need to serve. Why? Because that's what keeps our heart close to him. That's what keeps our affections warm. That's what draws us close to him. That's what keeps us close. It's a battle that we're in. And when we draw close to God's grace, when we see God's grace, it's our hearts that are transformed. It's our hearts that are changed into his image. So we as God's people, as the hymn writer says, prone to wander, Lord, I feel it, prone to leave the God I love. So what does the hymn writer said? Lord, take my heart, seal it, bind it, he says. A desperate plea of God's people. And so we have here the stubborn hearts of the people and the graciousness of our God. And so what does God do? He sets up a contest. God in his grace is going to show the people yet again who he is. And so Elijah outlines the contest, verses 22 to 24. It's quite a contest. They're on uh, Mount Carmel, which by the way, in the ancient Near East, Mount Carmel was called the Mountain of Baal. Uh, that's where Baal worship happened. And so God, he is, uh, he is coming right into Baal's turf here, right on Baal's territory. So from an ancient Near East perspective, Jehovah is at a significant disadvantage because God's operated within their own special geographical location. Jehovah is outside of his territory. He's on Baal's territory. So, so the, the, Baal has the advantage in this. And the, the contest is what? Two bulls are to be prepared as a sacrifice on respective altars, but no fire is to be put on them, and the God who answers by fire is the true God. Now, this is going to be a miracle, okay? I mean, there's supposed to be no fire and then fire. So it's a miracle. However, as miracles go, I mean, again, I'm not a God, but if you are a God, I mean, how much heat would it take to light wood that has not seen rain in three and a half years? Not a lot, right? So, so what is the contest? We just need a spark. <laughs> it's, just, it's a miracle, okay, it's a miracle, but I mean, as miracles go, like if you're a god, this really isn't a big miracle. You just need a few sparks on this wood to get this fire going. 
Now notice the contest specifically, though, is that it is the God who responds to the prayers of His people. Verse 24, you call upon the name of your God, I will call upon the name of Jehovah and the God who answers. So the contest is specifically an answer to the prayers of the people. But Elijah here is very specific. It's not just the God who answers in any way. See, in the ancient Near East, the, the prophets who represented their gods, they always ran interference for their god so that they could kind of twist the answer to however, you know, in case it didn't work out the way that they thought it would, then the prophets could say, well, you know, he was away, or they could give some excuse and give an out to their god. But Elijah, when he sets up the contest, it's not just the God who answers, it's the God who answers by what? The God who answers by fire. So there's a very specific answer. They can't make up their God and say, well, you know, he was just away. Or he answered, just maybe not in the way that we thought. No, no fire, no answer. Elijah makes it very clear. The God who is real will have to answer in such a way that it will be obvious to all. So on one hand here, um, Elijah stacks the cards against Jehovah. Okay, because he's on Baal's turf. There's, 400, there's 850 prophets of Baal and prophets of Asherah. So the cards are stacked against Elijah. The cards are stacked against Jehovah. On the other hand, Elijah is playing right in. Because what does Jehovah desire? Is Jehovah a God who hides himself? Is Jehovah a God who tries to keep people from getting to know him? That's not our God. Our God desires people to know him. And so Elijah is setting up a contest so that God can do what God desires to do. God likes to reveal himself to his people. So God, Elijah says, okay, God, this is your chief. Reveal yourself to your people. So who goes first? Well, the prophets of Baal go first. Uh, it specifically mentioned the prophets of Baal in this passage. In the, in the previous section, it also talks about the prophets of Asherah. The assumption is that both are there. So there's 850 of these false prophets that are there. They get the uh, altar together. They put the sacrifice on it. They put no fire to it. And they start crying out to Baal. Now, this would have been quite a spectacle, right? There's like 150-ish people here this morning. So you picture 850. That's a, that's a, that's a lot of prophets, all right? And they're not likely praying quietly. That's not how the ancient Near East religions happened. This is their chance in the spotlight. So they're hooping it up. They're, they're dancing. There's music. It's a huge celebration, so to speak. It's a huge spectacle that's happening. All morning they hoop it up. There's no answer. There's no voice. And we would add, there's no fire. So around noon... The text says in verse 27 that Elijah begins to mock them. Maybe Baal can't hear you. Well, if Baal can't hear 850 prophets, then Baal's got a hearing problem. Maybe Baal is musing. It means he's, he's meditating, he's thinking. In other words, this whole contest caught Baal by surprise. He just got out of left field and he's, he's having to think, oh boy, I, I, didn't, I didn't see this coming. Let me think about this. Let me consider. Let me, I'm not sure what to do about this. Maybe he says Baal is in the washroom. Baal is relieving himself. Right? What is, what is Elijah saying? <laughs> that, that Baal is subject to the same weaknesses as you and I. Maybe, maybe Baal is on a journey. Shoot, just when you need him the most, he's left. Maybe, maybe Baal is sleeping. Right? Baal's worked really hard, and he needs to recuperate. He needs to get his power back. Now, why is Elijah mocking the prophets? Now, Elijah's a very interesting character. Uh, Elijah, we would, I would say this about Elijah, he's not maybe somebody you really want to model your ministry after, okay? He's, a, he's a kind of an interesting character, okay? He, he goes about things in an interesting way. But I don't think Elijah's mocking the prophets. Who is Elijah mocking? The people of Israel. How foolish do those prophets look? And Elijah does not want the people to miss the point. Do you see how foolish you have been? Do you see how absolutely ridiculous you look? That's what you have been doing. That's who you have been calling to. You've been worshiping a God who can't hear you, who doesn't know your needs, who's subject to the same weaknesses of you, and who's not there when you need Him the most. And His power is limited. The psalmist says these words in Psalm 115, Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but uh, do not feel, feet but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. Those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in 
them. Elijah wants the people to see what they have become. You see, before change can take place, before transformation can take place, we need to see ourselves for who we are, right? We need to see our sin for who we are. We need to see our brokenness for who we are. God and his grace and his mercy is more than enough to forgive our sin and to, to overcome any weakness that we would have. But God wants us to see that. He wants us to see that. Why? To belittle us? No. But to magnify his grace. And so Elijah wants the people to see the condition of their own heart. It continues all afternoon. In fact, it gets worse because the prophets begin to mutilate themselves. And I, we won't go into detail here, but it's not paper cuts. Like it is a despicable spectacle on top of the mountain. And the author punctuates the response in verse 29. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. I think there's a hint of irony here. When Jehovah called to his people, how did they answer? It was silence. And so now as the people cry out to Baal, their God, what answer is there? Silence from that God. So now it's Jehovah's turn. Verses 30 to 38, Elijah has finally seen enough, and so he calls the people near. It says at the time of the offering of the oblation, some translations say the evening offering, uh, it's actually about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. So about the middle of the afternoon, Elijah says enough is enough. And verse 30 and 31, you notice there's some detail given here that on one hand doesn't advance the text. Why does he say this? Verse 30, uh, come near to me, he says. All the people came near to him. He repaired the altar of Jehovah that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. Israel, or Elijah builds an altar, but notice it's actually an old altar. The altar of the Lord had fallen into disrepair, and he repairs it in accordance with the word of the Lord which had been spoken to Jacob. By rebuilding the altar, Elijah here is reminding the people who, he, who they are. He's calling the people to remember their God and to remember the covenant that he had established with them. He's drawing their attention back. I love what Jeremiah says, the prophet Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 6, where he calls the people to follow the ancient roads. This is a human, human tendency. We're always looking for something new. We're always looking for something flashy. We're always looking for something, and God continually calls us back to the ancient paths to his word, to follow them. And Elijah, even by building the altar, is reminding the people, <laughs> you need to go back. You need to remember who your God is. You need to remember who you are. You are the covenant people of God. Elijah gets everything prepared, and then three times they douse everything with water. Uh, four jars each time. There's 12, um, 12 large jars that are dumped on this. This would take some time to saturate um, what, what is Elijah doing? It's going to take more than a spark now to light this thing on fire. Elijah is either being very foolish or very confident. He's either bluffing or he knows the cards that he's holding. And when everything is ready, Elijah calls on his God. Verse 36 and verse 37. Now there are a few things that we need to note about this prayer. First, we note this. It's short. Two sentences. Verse 36 he says, O Jehovah, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, that I have done these things at your word. Answer me, O Jehovah, answer me, that this people may know, O Jehovah, that you are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. In contrast to the prophets of Baal, they had prayed all day long, all day long, and nothing happened. One of the principles of ancient Near East religion was this, you get out of it what you put into it. And that's true of man-made religion, is it not? Right? The, the, the more you serve your God, the more your God serves you. Right? The more you do for your God, the more your God does for you. And so it's a it's contrast of pictures. How much energy do the prophets of Baal put in? They put a lot of energy in. How much energy does Elijah put in? <laughs> Two sentences. Right? Because he knows it's not about him. He's not having to conjure up God and wake him up. His prayer is short. Secondly, about his prayer, it's God-focused. Notice Elijah wants God to be glorified. He wants the people to see God for who he is. It's not about the fire, it's about God. We see the heart of Elijah come out in this passage here. What has his passion been? His passion has been for the glory of God among Israel. He wants the people to see God. He wants the people to know who God is. 
And so that is his prayer. God, show yourself to your people. But thirdly, there's something really strange about this prayer. Did you notice what's missing in the prayer? There's no fire. He never asks for fire. Elijah never prays for fire. Why doesn't Elijah pray for fire? Because he doesn't need to. Because Jehovah already knows. Jehovah already heard. He doesn't have to give the details to Jehovah because Jehovah heard him. And because the point is actually not the fire. The point is the glory of God. Jesus instructs his disciples to pray in this way. He says in Matthew 6, verses 7 to 10, When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do. They think they'll be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. That's Elijah's prayer. He doesn't heap up empty words. He doesn't have to conjure up God and wake Him up. No, no, he knows God's there. And he knows that God's hearing him based on God's grace, not about his good works. And so what does he pray for? God be glorified. God be exalted. God be honored among the nations. And then verse 38. His prayer is answered immediately and unmistakably. What does the text say? Verse 38. Then the fire of Jehovah fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. There is no hesitation in God's answer. God answers immediately. God heard his prophet because he's a living God. He knew his prophet's need because he's the all-knowing God. And he answered with fire even though Elijah didn't ask for fire because he knew the rules of the contest. There was no hesitation in God's answer. There was no missing God's power. This was no magician's trick. Notice what the author says. The fire of the Lord fell from heaven. (laughs) This was no natural phenomenon. This was not a meteorite that was well-timed out of heaven. This was not a bolt of lightning that struck the altar. No fire of this world consumes rock and dust and water like that. It was unmistakable. This was Jehovah God answering the prayer of his people. In contrast to Baal, in which there was silence, there was no answer. God answers in an unmistakable way. The question is, what kind of God can do this? Only a God not of this world. Only the true God. And so the people respond immediately. Notice in the text, I think it's interesting, Elijah doesn't have to ask the question again. What is the response of the people? That says the people fall on their faces when they saw and they cry out, the Lord or Jehovah, he is God. Jehovah, he is God. There's no hesitation in the response of the people. Their, their, Their worship is followed up by action. They take the prophets again down to the river. They slaughter the prophets. But there's something that's missing here. Look again at Elijah's prayer in verse 37. Elijah said, O Lord, answer me two things, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and secondly, that you have turned their hearts back. The response of the people is only one of those things. The people acknowledge what? Jehovah won. Jehovah is greater than Baal. But what's missing in their statement? Notice there's no personal pronouns. It's not Jehovah's my God. Jehovah is our God. No, it's Jehovah is the God. Jehovah won. Jehovah won. But there's no response of the heart. What was the question that Elijah asked the people at the start? Choose who you will serve. What's the people's answer? The Lord is God. The Lord is God. But there's no, we will follow him. We will give our lives to him. We will serve him. We will do whatever he asks of us. They acknowledge Jehovah won the contest, but they fail to give their hearts to him. They are wowed by God's power, but unmoved by his grace. How hard, how fickle the human heart can be. 
And God's point in this passage, and, and, and we'll touch on this next week in, in 1 Kings 19, Elijah doesn't even see this point. See, Elijah's thinking the glory of God, Elijah's thinking the rain is coming, but there's another point that God is making here that Elijah doesn't pick up on. God's point to Elijah and to the people is that if they will not believe his word, neither will they believe him, even though he shows up in an extraordinary way. In Luke chapter 16, we have the story of the rich man and Lazarus, and Lazarus is a poor beggar, and there's the rich man, and they both die, and they find themselves, the Lazarus in Abraham's presence, and, and the rich man in Hades, and the rich man cries out in agony and says to Abraham, send someone back to tell my family, send someone back that they might believe. He says, If someone goes from the dead, they will repent. And Abraham responds and says, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced should someone rise from the dead. We want to say that if I just saw, if I just experienced, or if if my family or or there's some unsaved uh, person I love, if they could just see, if they could just see, then they would believe. That's not true. Paul says, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of the Lord. The human heart response is this. God, if I see, I'll believe. But God says that doesn't work like that. If you believe, then you will see. You remember Thomas? Poor Thomas that missed out in the resurrection of the Lord. Says, unless I see, I'll never believe. Again, he's merciful. What does he do? He comes, he shows himself to Thomas, and then Jesus says these words in in John chapter 20. Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. We say, well, how would I believe if I can't see? How does that happen? Well, it happens because belief is based on the word of God. God reveals himself in his word. And when we read God's word, when God reveals himself to us and we believe, guess what happens? Then we see. Then our eyes are opened. Now, we see him in this world and we see God move and we see God work in this world and we see his hand at work. But be careful. The ultimate seeing and experience is not here. Right? We say, if I believe God, I want to see. And he says, you will. You will. One day. The ultimate seeing and the experience comes one day in eternity. That's why Jesus says, blessed are you. Blessed are you if you believe even though you don't see. Because one day your faith will become sight. One day you will see. But how gracious is our God? As we think about the passage here, the picture of God consuming the sacrifice is meant to remind Israel and us that our God is a redeeming God. By all rights, the fire should have fallen on those hard-hearted, stiff-necked people. It should have been those sinful, idol-worshiping Israelites that were consumed. But instead, God consumed the sacrifice. That, my friends, is what we call grace. The incredible, amazing grace of God. I think, well, God, I am so unworthy. And he's aware of that. But the point is that Jesus is worthy. So it's not, what, it's not about who I am, but it's ultimately about who he is. It's not about what I've done, but ultimately about what he has done for me. And so there's a choice that we need to respond to, is there not? There's a choice. Will we follow him? Will we give our hearts, will we give our lives to him to follow after him? In closing here, Paul writes these words in 2 Corinthians 5. He says, The love of Christ controls us because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sakes died and was raised. What is the motivation of the Apostle Paul to give his life to Christ? It's the love of God. 
It's the grace of God displayed specifically in Jesus Christ. Why would we give our lives to him? Why would we go out the door and live this week for Jesus Christ and not for ourselves? Why would we deny our own passions? Why would we set aside the things that we would want? Why would we say no to the temptations of this world to give ourselves to follow after one we cannot even see? Because he loves us. Because he died on the cross for our sin. Because he took our place. When the judgment of God should have fallen on me, it fell on Christ instead. And so because of that love, it consumes us. It controls us. And so we have a choice to make. But, but don't miss the point this morning. Don't focus on the choice. Focus on the love and grace that is yours in Jesus Christ. Because if you're focused on the love and grace that is yours in Jesus Christ, I can tell you which choice you'll make. Because the choices are hard. It's hard to follow him, but his grace is sufficient. If we will believe, we'll take him at his word and trust him. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, you are good and you are gracious. God, we see your power displayed in an incredible way here in 1 Kings chapter 18. And, and God, I do confess I am tempted to say, God, oh, I want to see that. If you would show me that. And yet here before me is your word. It is there. I just have to believe, God. I have to choose to say, God, I will take you at your word. I will follow you. That's what you call us to. That's what you desire of our hearts, Lord. It's your word that changes us. It's your word that transforms us. For it's in there I read and see your grace and your love displayed to us in incredible ways. So my prayer is this morning, God, that... that uh, everyone here would know that grace and love in their own lives and hearts and the choice that's before them. Will they follow? Will they commit their lives to you? Lord, that your grace would compel them, your love would draw them in. That they would know not only that you are God, but that you would be their God and you would trust them. They would trust you and follow you. God, thank you for your word. We are weak. We are sinful and we stumble, but you are gracious and good and you are always there. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.